the director for the Center for the Arts for several years, uh, and I um, have watched our, our featured guest tonight uh, come in as a freshman, and I'm super excited to see her return to show her artwork as an alum, as a proud alum. Uh, so um, I want to start off tonight by thanking Autumn Spears for being here and sharing her artwork so much. I've been following her uh, on Instagram. I encourage all of you to do that. Absolutely um, amazing stuff. But she does have three different um, handles. So you want to yes. make sure you get the art handle. And that is on the back of this particular publication. So if you want to see what she's doing for art, um, make sure that you follow her on Instagram there. But she also has one for teaching and then her personal one too. So um, we do have a trifold for this. And um, I want to also thank Kristen Woodward who wrote the critical essay for this. So as Autumn's mentor, someone who's also followed her work um, from the time that she came here, um, Kristen had some valuable insights to add to this. So I hope that you'll pick one of these up and take it with you. It's a great way to have a piece of Autumn's artwork um, as well to go home with you. Um, a couple of other thank yous. <clears throat> as always, we like to thank the administration, the faculty, the staff, and all of the students who support the gallery. So your attendance here at these lectures, at the receptions, um, just coming in to see what's new in the gallery is really important and we appreciate that support. Uh, we also appreciate the support of many donors. Those are listed in the CFA magazines and um, some of our programs that happen for our music and theater concerts. Um, and those are ever changing and evolving. Um, many of our donors are also on the Visual Arts Committee, um, and that's chaired by Yap Van Leer. So we thank all of those members for their advocacy and support. Um, and then all the other teams that make what we do in the gallery successful. So um, the folks in communications, Heidi and Carrie, um, who work on our publications, the facilities team um, that includes our custodians that keep our buildings clean, the food service teams that provided the reception tonight. Um, and of course, the, the team at the um, Friedman Gallery. And so a special thanks go to Stephen, um, Rich, uh, Dick, Kate, Abby, Raphael, who's our visiting intern from France, and also Kara. So thank you guys so much for all that you do to make the exhibits really, really shine um, in the gallery. Um, lastly, before I turn it over, I'd like to just mention that tonight we actually have several things that are happening on campus. There's some science events. Um, following this, we will have a reception in the gallery. Um, so you can come down, you can get a little food. Um, if you're old enough, you can get a little wine, right? So just show your ID. I'm old um, enough. You're old enough. <laughs> I'll make them cards, you know. Um, and uh, uh, see Autumn's work in person, which is yeah. so vibrant. Yeah. You really want to see it uh, in person. Um, the reception goes from 5 to 7. Um, at 5.30, though, we also have the International Day of Remembrance that's starting in here. In fact, Abby is going to be speaking as part of that. Um, and that's um, uh, in not really celebration, but to recognize um, the end of the international uh, transatlantic slave trade and to really kind of take a closer look at that. Um, we have a number of speakers that will be here presenting back in Klein. So if you're interested to have a little reception break and then come back here, you're welcome to do that. That's an experience event. There's a second day of that on Saturday that starts, um, it's a film, uh, starts at one o'clock in here in Klein, uh, will the, where they will be showcasing the film. Um, I think it's Los Negros? Los Negros. Yes, absolutely. And uh, Professor Morris from the Spanish department will lead a talk back after that. Um, and so that's another opportunity for you to get yet another experience credit, and also learn a little bit more about International Day of Remembrance. So those are my announcements. Definitely come down and see Autumn. You'll be able to talk to her in person, kind of ask some of the questions that you don't get answered here. But to lead the session, I'm going to turn it over to my esteemed colleague, the boss herself, yes. <laughs> Kristen Woodward. Kristen T. Woodward. Thank you, David. Thank you, Autumn. I guess. So thank you, thank you for coming back and sharing your story with us and providing your insights. So we wanted to make this more of a conversation. And so we have some general questions, but we'll leave plenty of time for you all to ask questions too, okay? So without further ado, I want you to take us through what was happening your senior year at Albright and what has led up to this moment. So what have you been doing? What's been happening? 
Lead okay. us up to where you were at graduation. Yes, so I was still a student here in 2020. It was my senior year. So everybody knows how the pandemic went, but especially being a senior, it was kind of just this big question mark whirlwind. I was in Brian's class. I was in Kristen's class. One minute we were here. Pretty much we went for spring break and never came back. Mm -hmm. So a lot of you guys, I'm seeing you for the first time since 2020. Um, yeah, it was really weird. I feel like I was very engrossed in my art at the time because at that time I was set up for like a student show. Mm -hmm. um, and that actually got postponed, but then it went virtual because everything went virtual in 2020. So um, yeah, I was very much in practice at the time of 2020 when I was in my senior year making art. But pretty much after that, I think I just kind of fell off. And a lot of people did because life as we knew it just stopped. People stopped going in person. Um, people's schedules just changed. Um, and I know that definitely happened for me. I was on Albright though too, um, the entire rest of senior year. So through the pandemic, me and a few other students. So I was in the studio by myself up until <laughs> move out day. Yes. So that then, gives you a picture of 2020 for me. <laughs> so then how, how, take us through graduation and through where you are now. So you had to go out into the world and yes. get a job. And so that was the biggest, like, like the biggest plot twist, I would say, <laughs> because I feel like everybody who's here in college, everyone's like, oh, well, at least the adults in your life are like mentors. Everyone's like, go to college. It'll give you so many opportunities. You're going to get a great job. And then I graduated in 2020 and it was just cricket chirps because the world was one big cricket chirp. So I was at home with my family, applying to jobs. I was an art education major. So at the time I was doing my student teaching as well. And then when that ended, I was applying for jobs, but everything just kind of stopped. Um, and that was probably like, well, it wasn't a, a full year. Cause I did find work like a few months after. Okay. Um, yeah, but it was just one big opening. And so I'm a teacher now. Um, I became one through the pandemic. So that's a thing. Everybody who's in here is a teacher, you know that that is a thing. Um, and I'm just making art now and trying to get back to it. Cause teaching has become a big part of my life recently and I'm trying to find that artist part again. So that's why I'm super grateful for this opportunity as well, because it's kind of pulling me back to my roots. Before I became a teacher, I've always been an artist. Interesting. What age are you working with? So I'm at the elementary level. So okay. everyone that is three years old to 11, they come to my class throughout the week. Wow. Yeah. We'll come <laughs> it's we'll a come lot. It's a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> we'll come back to that. So it was so nice to see your artwork in the gallery again. And I was reminded of your senior topic, studio topics work that you did with black hair. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of my students are interested in that. And they said they could really relate to the still lifes that had products as well as the pieces made with hair. Can you talk a little bit about that work? Yeah, so like Kristen said, I was in her class at the time, um, and I think everyone just kind of had to come up with this theme. And I know that's something like, I don't know, I've had big hair for a long time. It always wasn't like that. And my hair is definitely a big part of my identity. So that's something that I wanted to explore through art, just like through my own personal experiences, um, through shared experiences in the black community. Um, so yeah, it's a lot of personal and cultural ideas woven into those artworks. Whether it's like Kristen said, like physically showing works um, of products or like where you get into manipulating literally hair to create art out of that. Um, yeah, that's kind of just like a direction that it went in, but mm -hmm. I'm cool with exploring it. So is the audience for black women specifically, do you think, or is it? broader I think it can be broader like my sole intention when I created that like 
I wanted other black people in general, specifically black women, to feel seen, to have that nostalgia. Like there's certain products in there or certain um, just things that are a part of the black hair experience. Like as soon as you see this thing, you can remember a time when you experienced that or I don't know, like I'm thinking of the painting that I have in there of the hot comb. Like growing up, my hair was straight. Everybody's hair was straight um, as a kid. Natural hair wasn't a thing. And my hair was permed. Literally every morning, my mom was like touching up my edges with the hot comb. And a lot of people have that shared experience, especially if you're a black female. And getting burned by the comb is something. But it's like, it's super painful, but like it's a shared experience so you can laugh about it. So it definitely is for black people to identify with it, but it could also be a learning opportunity for others who look at it. And I know even some people like, some Hispanic people too, some of those things they reach over in the diaspora. It may not be a strictly black thing. Like it can be a lot of people's thing. Okay. So how does that work that depicts those products mm -hmm. and hair differ from the work that utilizes actual hair or weaves? Yeah. Some are very physical. Yes. That's a very good question. Um, I don't know. I just think about like when you see the things that actually have hair on them, that is very much a part of the experience as well. Because in a sense, it is a product. Like the hair that I use to create my dress with, that I use to create the chandelier with, you can literally go into a store and purchase that. And a lot of people put that in their hair. So it's both. Yeah, mm -hmm. it is hair, but it still very much is a product because it's still a part of that black beauty experience. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think of the the paintings as kind of illustrating the hair, and mm -hmm. the other ones are of really Literal of hair. the hair. They're, yes. they're more sculptural. Well, Keith Bryan agrees with that. Um, at least assemblage, right? And mm -hmm. they, they don't have the overt message, I think some of the other ones do. Mm -hmm. So, like the one with the flag or... Yeah, happening there. So that's kind of something like those are all newer works, like the dress, the chandelier. Those were all things that came out of your class when I was here as a student in 2020. Um, and kind of like I said, like the pandemic, it definitely was challenging for me, but it definitely I think I came out stronger because of it. Um, it gave me a period of rest that I think was good. It gave me a period of rest that definitely was forced because just the world was shut down. Um, and be, like I said, when I became a teacher, art, my personal art just kind of stopped. But now I'm picking up those pieces, revisiting some of those things. And I think before when I made like the dress and the chandelier, it was a part of one series but you know how sometimes when you go back and you have a little distance between certain events, it's like, oh, I see this differently and I wanna keep pushing this idea forward. So now the hair, I think, at first it was beauty, it was black beauty, but now I'm definitely taking that into elements of self-portraiture in a sense, even though it's not my face, it is something physical that could represent me as a person, ethnically. Yeah, I'm just using that more as representation now instead of literally always seeing a face. Yeah, that makes sense. So how does that dovetail into your digital work? Because that's a real another shift in media. It, and you were doing that here, but it seems like that has continued, like both of these veins, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, it's like, uh, like David was saying, I have a lot of handles. Even with my art, it's a lot of pots on the stove. Uh, I feel like I'm still working to see how they can be woven together because sometimes they do feel a little separate. But I remember a few years ago now, my mom, she gave me a tablet for Christmas. And I always seen digital art and I definitely explored it a little, like when I was in Matt's class, um, specifically on the computer but I don't know it's a different medium in itself because even when I use digital art my style in digital art does change a little bit mm -hmm. um, but yeah I don't know in the future I would like to try and weave those different mediums together because mm -hmm. right now it does feel like 
different pots on the stove instead mm -hmm. of like a stew. I don't know if that was but a good example. But you're still the stove. You're still I'm the stove. I'm still the stove. Right? Yeah. But each one is its own little pot. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. That makes sense. So tell us about the title of the show, Becoming. We talked a little bit yes. about that. But for everybody here and, you know, maybe ruminate a little bit more about how that came about and how you, how you feel about it. Yes. Okay. So spoiler alert. I did <laughs> not come up with the title of the show. Our lovely David Tanner over here did. He did incredible. And when he sent me the title at first, like how many people have heard of Michelle Obama's book, Becoming? Yeah. And so as soon as I saw that title, I was just like, whoa, like that's going to be the title of my show. Like that has a that has some some shoes to fill, like just with that title being attached to Michelle Obama. And like me and Kristen, we talked about this earlier when I saw it, I was kind of like afraid of it because I don't think like I'm very much a regular person. Like I'm here talking to you guys today, but like when I go to work on Monday, I'm an elementary school teacher. So I don't see myself in this super Michelle Obama box. Um, so when I saw the title, I was like, whoa, this is like big shoes to fill. But, and I thought about changing it, but over the course of the days, like, I don't know, I felt like it was very fitting because I am still becoming literally. Like I am where I am because of the different versions that I have become, like as an artist in my journey, as a student here at Albright, and I'm kind of still in that process as a teacher, as someone trying to find their voice outside of that, coming back to art. So I think it's very fitting because I feel like sometimes like everybody thinks like there's this one destination, like you become this one final work and that's who you're gonna be forever. Um, but there's various versions of ourselves over the course of our life. So you guys are seeing like parts of old Autumn, who she was, and now who I have become as a product of all of the experience that I've had, all of the mentors that I've had. So I think it's very fitting. At first it was intimidating, but I don't feel that way anymore because mm -hmm. I am literally still becoming someone, something. Yeah, it does seem like there is that thread mm -hmm. in the work in the gallery, the idea of, of this, I think I wrote in that short essay, like the idea of gestating and yes. ideas and something forming. So can you talk about, and this is the longer conversation, I think the, the influences behind that imagery, that iconography and mm -hmm. choices that you make and why you work with certain figures? Yeah, there's a lot of different influences. Um, yeah, one of my favorite artists, her name is Micheline Thomas. Um, she's a very big influence in the hair series that I do. Um, also, just like my own background, like being a black person in America, specifically being a black woman in America, um, being a Christian, like that was a big influence on one of the first bodies of artwork that I made here at Albright. So a lot of it is just personal experience some of my favorite artists. Um, yeah, they definitely inspire some of the images that you see um, and just some of the materials that I use as well. Glitter. Glitter, I love glitter. Micheline made me love glitter. Sequins, I love, like, I love it so much um, and just what it does. What does that inject into the painting? Wait, what'd you say? The glitter. What is what does the glitter do in the painting that paint doesn't do? Yeah, it just, I don't know, like I'm thinking about the Genesis series that I have. Um, like Micheline is just an influence in general when it comes to materials, but specifically like in that series, when you think about Genesis and it being this very big creation story, um, whether it's a myth, whether it's truth, whatever you find in it, it's definitely like, some mystery there and just that glitter for me I don't know it just screams mysticism to me I don't know and that's what I used a lot of glitter in that series for to kind of highlight just some of that mysticism whether it's when you think about literally the earth in the Genesis story when you think about some of the characters that are in the story or some of those elements that are very, the fruit in the story. Like, what does that 
symbolically mean versus what it actually is. Um, yeah, it definitely, the glitter does the mysticism for me in that series. When I look at the fruit, I can't help but seeing the relationship with the pregnant women. Yes. I made that comment. Is, do you feel like that you intended that? Is that an association you expect the viewer to make? Um, I don't know. I think definitely like being in your class, Kristen, it definitely taught me a lot of things. Just when it comes to symbolism, I definitely learned some of that in your class because I don't know. I don't think everything always has to be literal in your face, but you can definitely use images to be suggestive. And that's what like specifically the fruit does in those pieces, whether it's alluding to fertility, whether it's al alluding to the storyline of the Genesis um, story. Um, yeah, it can be figurative. It can be literal. Is it ever just fruit? Sometimes it could <laughs> be. If you want to bite it, don't bite my painting, but get you a piece of fruit. Bite okay. it. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. So the pregnancy, the image of the globe, mm -hmm. is that literal pregnancy or is that metaphoric? Both. Okay. Um, yeah, when I'm thinking about Genesis and you have Eve as this central character to the story, literally she is the first mother on earth in the story. But also when you think about her role, it's like everyone in humanity comes from her in some shape, whether you believe it literally, whether you believe it figuratively, like that's just kind of what her character represents. So I chose the earth to be her um stomach to kind of reference that just like literally she is the first mother she is the symbolic image of motherhood at least to me um and okay. in that painting yeah well i think i know the answer to this but since students were asking me they couldn't help notice the skin color mm -hmm. of some of the figures changed and they were curious about that yeah, definitely with my Genesis series. I'm, I know you guys are probably tired of hearing it. But, no. okay. Yeah, like, I don't know. Like, especially me being a black Christian, like, that's a thing. Because um, <laughs> Christianity has definitely, um, depending on who you're talking to, depending on where you are, it definitely, people think it looks a certain way. When people frame the Bible, they frame it in a certain way. And when you think about these places geographically, some things don't add up. But also, I just feel like sometimes when you think about race in the Bible, every person in the Bible is white. Geographically, that just does not make sense. Um, but also, it's just like, why do we see it in this framework? So the colors that I use for those characters, it's definitely, I'm trying to remove some of those layers, some of those perceptions that have been brought onto these stories. Because I think it definitely changes the way that people interact with them. Like if you don't see people that look like you in a story, it definitely shapes your framework of how you feel about it. So sometimes I am using like just really deep, re realistic skin tones but sometimes I like to include like those warm oranges incorporating those purples to kind of just come up with this own thing like this racially ambiguous figure okay. so you do want us to question race but yes. not necessarily assign race does that yes. make sense because I think sometimes when you think about race and like I said just I know in my own personal experiences with being a black Christian it's just like when you don't see people that look like you, that kind of changes the way that it is experienced for you. It changes the mindset that you have thinking about how you relate to the Bible. Mm -hmm. And it can be a barrier yeah. sometimes. It's interesting that you're, you think a lot about the viewer. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, often when young artists start making, they're kind of like, oh, they're making it for myself. And I definitely am. As opposed to but thinking think about the communication. A to lot the viewer. of people think about that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you're very sensitive to how that's being perceived. Mm -hmm. So I can't help but, but wonder and ask, and this kind of goes back to your teaching, has teaching influenced the way that you make art? Absolutely. Like some of the later artworks, um, because you know how, like, when you're teaching things to someone, you're supposed to be an expert in them. Because <laughs> it's, let me not say an expert, but, like, I don't know. There's always that question, especially with kids. Well, why? Why? 
why? Why? And it's like, okay, I need to know the answer. I need to know your why. So I'm definitely, even though I'm teaching them, I'm definitely learning in the process. And what I'm learning beside them sometimes, in a sense, it definitely impacts what I thought I knew. Um, and it just gives me a new perspective to look at things with. Like earlier before I came here, I was working on a painting at home. And recently, um, with some of the older grade levels that I have, we've been learning a lot about African-American quilting. And that's something that I'm like, ooh, I think I, that's something that I want to go into. Not necessarily with fabric, but just like, I don't know. It's something that I want to explore. But that little spark happened because I'm in the classroom, because that's what I'm teaching with my students. And it, I'm also absorbing it the same way that they are. Yeah. So do you find you have to carve out time differently to make art once you're out of school than you did when you were in school? Kind of an obvious question. Yes. So maybe I should rephrase. Yes. How do you carve out time to, to make art? I'm just going to say TBD, <laughs> to be determined, because okay. that's something that I'm trying to figure out in the, um, in the process, because it's so hard, especially just since I'm a new teacher. Um, yeah, it's really hard, but the summers, definitely, they're open, just get some time to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's definitely hard during the school year. But like even having this show, like it really forced me like, hey, this is the opportunity. This is holding me accountable. Make time for it. Because mm -hmm. one of the things like that I think I'm definitely learning in general as a person, but the lesson came through teaching was just like you cannot pour from an empty cup. Like I am just, you can't be a hundred zero like you have to meet some way I can't give teaching my full life and then let the artist inside me die so that's something that I'm like still working on the balance with mm -hmm. yeah but this show definitely was like a great motivator it's like hey this is the date you need to finish it yeah deadlines always help. yes in or yes. out of school right <laughs> deadlines yes yeah I mean I, I talk about that a lot that you know students sometimes you know don't want as much feedback as they get you remember those days right a yes. lot of feedback a lot of critiquing but at some point you don't have that voice constantly questioning you so does that voice become internal internal or, or where does that voice come from then when you're trying to grow your work and trying to get feedback yeah like I definitely like even when I was working on some of the pieces for the show because a lot of the pieces they are from older time periods and there are a few that are new but definitely time like creating some type of time whether it's a day whether it's a week whether it's a few months I think time is definitely that voice of feedback because you may feel one way when you're working on it but then when you stick it take a step back it can kind of change the way that you see things or just asking people like I ask my mom, what does she think all the time? She may not necessarily know what it means, but if I try this out, I'm like, hey, what do you think of this? Mm, I think I liked it the other way. Okay, let me explore that more. Mm -hmm. But okay. I don't know, I think anybody, they may not have the critical eye that you're looking for, like a professor would or like art critic would, but I don't know. I utilize the people around me. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. don't have to be professional. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, absolutely. Because yeah. they're your audience, exactly. right? And you want to see how it's being received by mm -hmm. your audience. Yeah, yeah. So, of course, the last real question I have for you, and we can just I'm like, we're back. at the end. Sorry no, we're not if at I've the been end. rambling. No, no, no. We're like, not even. <laughs> okay. Not even. Um, but the, the other question I wanted to ask you specifically is what advice you would have for undergraduate autumn? because you know, you're one of the younger artists that we've showcased in the mm -hmm. Freedman in terms of your distance from undergraduate. And I think they'll listen to you and they don't listen to me. <laughs> I don't know. So what, what advice, what would you have liked to know, do you think, when you were here a few years ago? That I honestly don't know because I feel like I absorbed a lot. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like just having really great friendships, having really great mentorship. 
I don't know. Like, I just feel like I received a lot of good, sound judgment here. So I don't know if there's anything different. No regrets. No. Okay. No regrets. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. Well, what did you do right? What did you think that you took advantage of here that really helped you, maybe? Yeah, I think, like I said, taking advantage of the people that are around here, of your professors, like, they're skilled. A lot of them, yeah, they're teachers, but like one of the things that I love so much, especially like having you guys as professors, like you're still out in the art world making art. Cause sometimes like when people are going to people for advice, it's like, oh, okay, like you have a 30 year career in this specific field, but you're not currently there. So some of the advice, some of the feedback, in a sense, it can get dated. But it's like, oh, I'm learning from people who've been in this field for a really long time. They're still currently putting their art in shows. They're telling me about opportunities. And I just really wanted to take advantage of that. Um, like, I don't like to pretend that I know everything. So just learning from the people around you. Like, mm -hmm. everyone's a student at some point in their life, whether you're sure. still in school when you come out of school, like I'm very much a student still. Um, so yeah, I just think just being humble and just utilizing the people that are around you because they won't always be there. Right. What about the whole liberal arts experience? Did that tie into your work and your thinking? I definitely think so because it's like you're exposed to just more, more than just art. Um, like just locking yourself in a studio and making art every day is just really boring because it's like, well, where does the inspiration come from? What are you learning? How are you learning how to think about certain things and how to perceive the world that's around you? So I definitely gained a lot of that from being in a liberal arts school, um, taking various classes that you may not have just strictly at an art school. All day we're talking about painting but we're not talking about paintings that have come from history. We're not talking about cultures that have survived longer than we have, cultures that have come before us. Yeah. So did you take a religion class? Did you take anything that inspired yeah. your work? Um, I don't necessarily know if I had exact religion classes that inspired my work, but Maybe this isn't a good example because it was an art class, but it was an art history class. Um, and that one definitely, I would say, just learning how to read images, utilizing symbolism. Um, yeah, and I think that definitely shaped the way that I think about art. And I definitely see those influences in some of the work that I'm doing now. Like even just exploring portraiture without using traditional portraiture. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that I got from a history class. So what's next for you? That's a good question. Definitely um, just pursuing more art because it's something I think like when everybody's in school, like I was having this conversation um, earlier with a student, like when I was in high school, my school was one of those places like you have to apply for college before you graduate that is a requirement but me being artist i'm just like what am i what am i going to college for to be an artist but it had me thinking kind of just like on a single track like being practical in art looks a certain way hmm. um and that i feel like has definitely been the path that I'm now starting to see like this isn't the only path. Hmm. And that's why, like I said, I'm super grateful for this opportunity because I love art. I've been making art forever, but I never saw myself in a place like this. Hmm. I never saw myself having a show because hmm. that just wasn't practical. And okay. everybody always tells you, think practical. How are you gonna sustain yourself with art? But it's like, this could be practical for someone. Mm -hmm. Showing your art could be a career path. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that I think I let other voices um, just kind of like hide that part in me. Mm -hmm. It was just like, go the, the follow-up path. 
Mm -hmm. Make the sustainable choice. Not sustainable, that's not the right word, but the predetermined choices. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a certain vulnerability you have, I think, in exhibiting your work. Do you feel yes. that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and I think maybe different, more so than being a student, too, because there's a different expectation, right? Yeah, but I think it's just, I don't know, that's why I said, like, with the title, like, it's just very fitting because it's just showing my journey, just figuring things out. Like, I'm only three years removed from college, mm -hmm. so I'm very much still on this path. I'm not an established artist yet. Let's keep those words, yet. Yes, let's keep those but words. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. just still figuring things out um, and just trying to pursue art as a dream. Yeah, you're doing it. Yeah, living I'm the dream. I'm trying. Living the dream. <laughs> you have a question? I just wanted to add something to what um, Autumn said and what your question was about it kind of how the exhibit came to be in some ways and what Autumn did right um, from the beginning. And one of the things that I remember Autumn very distinctly doing as a freshman was entering her work. She was very new here. One of the first things she did entering work into um, the, the fashion competition for mm. the poster that year. You weren't a fashion student, right? But you had like three designs that you entered and they were all really in the top consideration that year. And your it, one of those image was selected for the poster. And what that did was put Autumn's name in my mind right away because she was an art student, but also she had won this competition that was outside of the art department. And so I watched you for four years, really while you were here, very, very closely. And it was because of that really early interaction that you had that put you in front of me. And I mean, you didn't know this, but I knew about halfway you were through here that you were coming back here to do this show. Wow. <laughs> he knew. No, you, no, you, all, you, you knew that, yeah. You did, yeah. yeah. And you don't remember this probably either, but you visited during COVID one of the shows that we had because we were still open. And you came and I did a little virtual tour with you and I even asked you, to, you know, would you ever see yourself, you know, being in the, uh, in a, in the show like this and I remember you were like really kind of hesitant like oh, I don't know you didn't want to say I was like yeah it's gonna happen but that's funny he knew I did know <laughs> <laughs> let's open this up to some more questions because you guys will probably can, have can to I add a twist to the questions that uh, David and Kristen have, uh, asked about influences can you recall uh, all, all these students are here seeing you as a an artist with the show in the Freedman can yeah. you remember a Friedman show or an artist talk or an artist visit that just sort of struck you and, and put sparks in your head? Yeah, there were definitely a lot. I think one of the more recent ones that I remember, like close to the time I graduated, was the Max Glover one. Yeah. And he was like an installation artist. And that was really new. Jose Villalobos, all amazing. Um, really contemporary artist doing something that I never saw before. Um, it definitely gave me an appreciation for performance art, for installation art, because um, that was something that I never saw tangibly. Like you always hear people talk about it in theory, and it's always like these big art ideas that maybe they only understand, but the viewer, they don't get the clue, you know? But those were really cool shows that were more recent, I remember here that were impressive. Ooh, there's a question back there. Hi. Um, you know, I hear you and when you talk about all the things that you're doing and how you're juggling it, mm -hmm. you get the time to sit down and do art. What happens when you have a creative block? What do you do to get over that? Yeah, I think, I don't know, this may not be good, but I definitely don't force myself um, creatively because it's kind of just like you're spinning wheels and I think time like I'm just a very time sensitive person like it's crazy to me how much time passes but also I think there's so much clarity in giving yourself time because like a decent amount of the artworks that I have in the show it's crazy to think that those were from five years ago like I have some of my friends in the room who remember when I made them. 
and that was five years ago. That's crazy to think. But only last week, some of the changes that you see have come about. Mm. And I don't know. I think our culture definitely has this attitude of you should always be moving. Like, if you don't know what to do, just keep going until you figure it out. But I personally don't think that that is healthy. Like, I just know for me and my experiences, definitely getting older, like, time just gives so much clarity. Yeah. But when you have the idea, hold on to it. If it's the middle of the night, I am one of those people that will wake up and write it down and sketch it because you don't want to lose it. And sometimes it's just a lot trying to keep everything in your head. So release it on paper. Hopefully that answered your question. And I'm really happy to see you. More questions for Autumn. Hi, Carmen. <laughs> how, um, post-college, how are you managing, like, your creative outlet? I'm sorry if I missed this, but it was Oh, no, you're good. But how are you still finding time to, like, dedicate to your art while trying to have a full-time job? Yeah, and that's, like, we talked about it a little bit, but that's very much a real challenge. Because one of the things that happened, like, graduating during the pandemic, like, I had all of this extra time. Um, because everything was canceled. But then at the same time, even though I got a lot of time back, that I, I don't know, I was involved in a lot of stuff on campus. So if you experience burnt out autumn in college, I am so sorry. <laughs> um, I'm so sorry. But it was a lot. But then when the pandemic happened, like I got a lot of that time back, but then there was no transition from post-college to real life quote unquote. Um, and it just became really hard because it was like you had all of the time, then no time. Um, and that's something that I think like recently I'm just trying to be more cautious and try to create some boundaries because work is important, but work cannot consume you. And that's just something that I've definitely learned and like we talked about, having deadlines like this show, it is a great motivator. Because if you don't get it done, well, that's on you. But it's definitely a challenge. Um, I'm still figuring that out. I'm sorry if I don't have the answers. Do you have a studio space or designated space that you make art? Or is it just kind of filling in the gaps of your day? It's just at home. Like. I'm sitting on the floor in the living room painting. Maybe I'll pull out my little fold out easel. But that's something like I'm having the show has definitely opened my eyes to what could be and to really just take myself more serious as an artist. Whether like there's a fellowship that I want to apply for in the coming year. I want to apply for this program that's in DC that you can get studio space for. Um, I'm starting an application for that because just to, I don't know, just take yourself more seriously. Like I'm saying that to you guys, but that's something like that I'm telling myself as well, like to really invest. I love making art at home, but I know if I had a studio space, like that would be a total game changer. Because that's one of the things I loved about the studio here. Like that was like my home away from home, away from home. Yeah. You have a lot of different media. Um, yeah. Do you find yourself going back to anything more recently specifically? Like, I see, I saw you a lot of digital prints. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, is that appropriate? No. So that's one of the things, like, I am like a DIY, make it work type of person. All of the digital art that I use is on a free program. Literally anyone can download. It's called iBeast Paint X. I know I wanted to use Procreate, I wanted to use Photoshop, but I don't have an Apple tablet, so I kind of just used what was in the store for me, but I don't know. Because I think sometimes when people, when they think about making art, it's always like, oh, but when I have this, then I'll be better. When I have this, X, Y, and Z will start falling into place. But I'm one of those people, like, whether it's culturally, whether it was the way I was raised in my family, like, you just make it work with what you have. Like, 
People are like, how did you do this? A free program. You want me to show you where you can get it? It's free. Anybody can use it. So the second part of that mm -hmm. is, is, do you find yourself going back to more painting, more sculptural stuff currently? Are you, what's your current yes. trajectory on stuff you've been working on? Thank you for that question. Recently, it's been kind of both back to painting and sculpture, kind of mixing those together. Cause that's what I started in. Like when I came to Albright, I did not paint before I came to Albright. Um, I strictly did like marker, color pencil, graphite. First painting class I took was with Kristen and now that's what I do. Um, but I'm definitely like Kristen kind of alluded to that earlier. I want to work and see how I can combine those together. But right now, definitely the painting and the sculpture are coming together. I want to see where I can weave some of that digital art into it, too. Because sometimes it feels separate. We have another question back there. Um, I was just wondering, like, if you could go into detail about your creative process. Like, you get a blank canvas. And mm -hmm. Do you know what you're going for? Do you just, or, yeah, just can you talk about that? Yeah, I have become one of those people where... I have to plan out everything. I wasn't always like that, but when you do that, it definitely helps to lessen the friction. Like I've been, <laughs> I'm trying to think of the best way to say it. Like a lot of the things that I'm trying to learn just from life, lifestyle, and seeing how that translates into art. Like every weekend I am watching videos on how to better organize my life, how to better organize my time. And sometimes, <laughs> and I'm telling you, like that is the same thing with art as well. Because when you don't have certain things figured out, either you never get around to it or you're just spinning your wheels. Um, a lot of the ideas that I have, like I said, time, I revisit my old sketchbooks. Like I keep those in my closet, keep them in drawers. Cause I think everybody comes up with good ideas. And even though you may not have the full vision there, keep it, write it on a piece of paper, write it on a note so you can always revisit it. So a lot of the artworks that you see now, those are old ideas that I had from more than five years ago, but I just never followed up on them. But when it comes to seeing an artwork carried out, like I'm definitely making sketches of it, definitely writing down the process. Step one, paint the canvas. What else is going in this? Then what do I need to do for the 3D part? Me and David talked about this. We're both list people and I'm a list person and have become one definitely when I'm doing my art to kind of just keep me on track. But it's okay if you go off track, but just, I don't know. It helps me to not just spin my wheels and just sit in the artist block. I think there's a wonderful interplay between the uh, exhibit of Femi Johnson's work and the main space and Autumn's painter, uh, paintings. You, you're both painters, uh, but he, he, he is working so intuitively and he's letting the brush and letting the canvas itself give him the feedback and let him figure out where it's going next and that sort of thing. Whereas I think you do have that image in mind mm -hmm. and you're achieving it in a, in a very painterly way, mm -hmm. but uh, it also represents something. Uh, idea I think there's got to be an audience for for your work out there because it is so intriguing and it's so very personal but it's also accessible right I think uh, the students who are going to encounter it for the first time are going to look and say oh yeah I could I could see that that speaks to me I see what's being said here and it may not be your idea it may be their idea but mm -hmm. it, it really communicates so directly and I, I think somebody not saying commercial art or illustration, but maybe a book cover or something like that is, is, is in your future because it, it, it has such an impact. I just wanted to remind people too, because we've talked a lot about the painting that you've done, we've talked about the digital work, um, but you also have an amazing suite of drawings that are in the case um, in the center of the gallery. And they're kind of unassuming because they're not large scale, right? Um, but the detail that's in those works is amazing. And in some ways, even really outshines some of the other work when you look closely at it. Um, 
could you talk a little bit about that? Because we haven't really talked about drawing mm -hmm. as one of the media that you do. Um, and I'd love to hear Kristen's take on that as well, now that she's drawing professor again. So. <laughs> nice. Yeah, like I mentioned, drawing was my first medium ever. Like, since I was, I was a kid, I've been drawing, and that was something that pretty much carried me to college. I'm definitely a control freak when it comes to those things. So drawing is definitely one of those things. You know every single move that you are gonna make. There are no questions about it. Whereas with my painting, I feel like that definitely loosened me up and you don't have to have everything kind of planned out um, when it comes to making some of those um, marks. But I definitely wanted to include those because like we keep talking about like with this title of becoming like that is a part of myself who I was and I'm still I don't want to leave those previous versions of myself off to just die like I just want to see like a circle instead of everything just being linear like oh I was drawing before I went to college then I stopped to paint then I stopped to do sculpture then I stopped to do 3d I mean um, digital art um, I just want just these different parts of myself to just keep going so that's why i just i don't know i like revisiting a lot of my old artworks um seeing some ideas that never got completed and working on artworks to finish those thoughts um, yeah hopefully that answers your question yeah i would just add that you know in drawing it's more about line mm -hmm. right and painting is more like mass and color a lot well, of times you think about the shading part yeah, too. Yeah, a lot of times we think about drawings as like a preliminary work before you do a painting, mm -hmm. but I think you think of drawing as like a finished yes. piece, and the fact that they're really small, there's mm -hmm. like an intimacy there that forces you to come closer and look, whereas the paintings you have to kind of step mm -hmm. back to appreciate. So it's that kind of spatial relationship. Yeah, that I didn't think about happens. that, but that's a good observation. I mean, drawings have an emotion as, as well. I mean, I think some of the things are iconic that are iconographic almost, mm -hmm. uh, whereas the, the drawings seem so personal. And, and mm -hmm. there, there is, you know, feeling behind those faces. And yeah. the fact that they're in the vitrine in the case, they function as objects too, they're mm -hmm. like things, mm -hmm. rather yeah. than pictures of things. So I think we also approach them differently, mm -hmm. both, you know, physically and emotionally, mm -hmm. you know, that we're visiting this like precious object that's under glass almost. I didn't think about that, but that's cool. See, we need to have more conversations. Yes, on this it. is why I'm glad I'm back. <laughs> Engaging well, with the intellectuals. I know we have to go. Can we have one more conversation? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. Because this was Autumn's first time also kind of looking at things with a curatorial eye as well, like how she wanted her work to be shown in a different way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, um, so we talked about some of those things in terms of like the case. And yes. um, you'll also notice there's a, a bank of digital work above mm -hmm. the two um, um, uh, almost like diptych pieces. That's all shout out to David. I was, I was No, no, no. That's, that's something that you made, or we discussed collectively, and you made that decision. But one of the things that was interesting is there was one painting in particular that immediately I oriented as, oh, yeah. Yeah, as yeah. vertical. However, we had this conversation <laughs> about it originally being a mm -hmm. horizontal painting. So could we talk a little bit about that piece before we go in? Yeah, I really liked it horizontally. Really? Yeah, I mean, okay. I guess, I guess I we had this debate with me and my mom had this debate before I dropped it. Uh oh. Off. Uh -oh. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I think the connotations of this Earth Mother. Mm -hmm. I saw the figure as being Earth, as mm -hmm. being land and space, yes. and that the Earth was kind of growing out of her. And I think when it's vertically oriented, that figurative presence is much stronger yes. than the earth presence and mm -hmm. I think that's why I, I keep seeing it or as, as a horizontal yes because originally as a landscape yes. you know yeah. originally when I created it in the first time that I show that that's exactly how it was yeah but we get back to that time piece five years later I'm looking at this painting and I'm working on it in the vertical way yeah um, to just add some of those finishing touches and I was like, I think I really like it this way. 
because it hits me, it hits different it than it did before. It's a different piece Because it vertically. definitely, having it horizontal, you get that connection to the earth, mm -hmm. the land. Um, but I just think coming back to it later, my perspective about it changed, and I just, the focus changed for me as well. Like, I think that connection to the land is still there, mm -hmm. but it's just not as much in the foreground as the right. figure is now. Right, right. Yeah. But Different emphasis. It was in the student show, right? Was it? Was it in the student show? I don't know if that one was in the student show. Something similar, I think. Yeah, because I did have my own show, so that's where you probably oh, saw in the it, student yeah. space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have another question. It's actually, it's from both of you. I know. Did you? Do you feel like you helped to create an audience? Did this, or, or, or was there always this person? And I ask you that because as instructors, you know, we always have the chance to mold and and, and help develop the student. But what do you say for the student that's like, man, I, I you know, I'm, I'm looking at her. I see her. I, I'm, I'm never going to get there. I, thought I was an artist or maybe feel like I'm not, I'm, I'm not that good. Well, Autumn was good when she walked in. I mean, you know, it, it was easy. It was easy. I think, you know, as someone who teaches, the challenge is how do I meet her where she is and get her to really see her potential, yeah. right? And we were just talking in my class just an hour ago um, about a Jerry Saltz uh, comment that he put on either Twitter or Instagram. He said, if your professor tells you you're great and just keep going, you're getting robbed. <laughs> I thought that's true. You know, my, my goal is not to tell her how wonderful she is, even though she's wonderful, but to, you know, try to see her full potential, ha her full self. So, you know, I kind of skeeve at glitter. You know, it's kind of like, oh, you know, I hate glitter. But Lots it, of glitter it in works. the show. Tons of <laughs> She makes it work in her painting. So it's kind of like, all right, teach me where you're going with this, you know. So I'm absolutely learning from her. But I think, you know, forcing you to have that dialogue is where the teaching takes place. And, hey, I need it too. You know, I've been out of school 30 years, more maybe. Um, and I still feel like you need to kind of check yourself and have – dialogue with your with your audience and like is this making sense am i communicating it so yeah i think it's a give and take that doesn't end i really don't but what a great question yeah i definitely am like everybody is who they are when they're born like that's just facts that's who you are but i definitely am who i am because of a lot of people in this room and I'm just going to say that. Good or bad? <laughs> For the better or the worse. Because literally, like, I can remember, and it's anybody's class, whether I've been in Kristen's class, whether I've been in Brian's class, whether I've been in Pancrat's class, you know how you have that idea in there? You know how you see those movies where it's the angel and the devil? It's like, okay, who are they going to be? They're telling me to change something, but am I perceiving it in the angel? Am I perceiving it in the devil? Like, oh, well, where's that going? You have so many questions. You have so many questions. But they're definitely, they've definitely led me to just growth, look at my art from different perspectives, whether that's been writing, whether that's been physically making art. Um, yeah, and it's, and I've always, I appreciate that it's always been that give and take. Because like, even now that I'm a teacher, like I've become so much more reflective of it. Because pe I think when people think of teachers, it's always, the information is going one way, is going straight from teacher to student, only in this way. But I loved, especially that my experiences at Albright, the arrow was always going both ways. I never felt patronized. I never felt like, oh, I know better than you, so you should go in this direction that I think you should go in. It was always that give and take, that mutual growth, like I wanna see where you're going, I wanna see where you're coming from, where you're giving me your opinion, where you're giving me your guidance. And I've been super appreciative, super grateful for that, because not everybody has those experiences. But I'm grateful that I had those experiences here at Albright. Us too. Yes, thank you.